I, I have a message here that my good friend here gave us a few weeks ago, and this kind of gave way to this today. Listen to me, my sons. Listen to me, my daughters. Why do you continually hide behind a hedge? What do you think you can keep from me? I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the ending. I see all. I know all. Why do you think you can hide things from me? Why do you walk in toilet? And on the other end of that, he spoke about, bring it to me and lay it at my feet, and I will heal you. I will deliver you. I will do good things for you. Now, that was a message in tongues and interpretation Dennis gave, I think it was three weeks ago. I'd have to look it up. But uh, I, I, I know you never hear things. No, that was uh, July 17th, 2019. I'm sorry, July 7th, 2019. I said 17th, didn't I? Yeah, that's when that was. But I always say, like when we get messages here, we, we kind of like, oh, that's wonderful. We had a message in tongues interpretation. Well, God's talking to us as a people. You know, he talks to us as individuals, but he's talking to us as a people. And he's saying things to us. Now, I don't know who that was directed at or if it was directed at everybody or what, whatever the case was. But we have a habit of hiding things in our hearts and thinking God don't know about them. I don't know why we think that. There is nothing that God don't know. There is nothing he does not see. Even if we weren't saved, he knows everything they do and everything that they're thinking about and everything they will ever think about. Because God is God. And God knows everything. So anyway, I was pondering about that a little bit and uh, asking the Lord about it. And the Lord was talking to me about a lot of things. And he was talking to me about Jacob and Esau. And uh, I thought that was what this was going to be about, but it didn't. Then he brought me to Genesis 32, verses 24 through 38. And that says there, and Jacob was left alone. Now, this is after Jacob had, uh, you know, swindled his brother and all that stuff and went out to Lebanon and got his wives and his wife's uh, handmaids and so on and so forth, and he, he was headed back. And this is, this is at that point where he's going to meet up with his brother uh, on the other side of the river. And it was uh, Jacob was left alone, and there were, he wrestled with a man with him until the breaking of day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh. And the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. Now, I want you to catch this because I never really caught this before. It, it wasn't that Jacob wasn't prevailing. It was the other person wasn't prevailing. So we know it wasn't strength. It had nothing to do with strength. There was another thing going on here. There was something else going on here. So he touched the hollow of his thigh and knocked it out of joint to weaken Jacob. To weaken Jacob. And he, uh, <laughs> I guess this is a misprint. <laughs> and uh, so he said, let me go. I got to skip over that. For the day breaks and he said, I will not let you go except you bless me. That's Jacob. And he said unto him, what's your name? And he said now to him, Jacob. And we know that the word name Jacob he got because when his brother was coming out of the wound, he's grabbed his foot because he wanted to go first, but Esau got out first. And uh, Jacob actually means supplanter, underhanded. You know, he's sneaky. He's, he's, always, he's always trying to turn the tables. And he said, your name shall be no more called Jacob, but Israel, because a prince you have power with God and with men, and you have prevailed. You have prevailed. You, you are blessed now. You have changed. Something happened in that engagement. Something happened in this encounter he had with God. It brought about a metamorphosis, right? A change in a person. Uh, Jacob, uh, the struggle wasn't for Jacob to believe in God. He believed in God, but to change his intent. 
his opus, his work. I call it your magnum opus. Jacob was a manipulator who always tried to twist everything to his advantage. He was always conniving. He always had something going on. He's always trying to take advantage of people, had it come out on top. That's what he did with his brother. That's what he tried to do with his ankle. He would lie, he would cheat in order to get the birthright of his brother he, uh, and the blessing of his father. He would lie about who he was. He, was, he, uh, he just went through 21 years of finding out he wasn't the only one that played that game. Ain't that amazing? <laughs> he met his uncle, right? Moving on. Now he's running from it right into the dealing with his past and asking God for help. Now he's going to face his past. He's going to face the one that he stole his birthright from, who, who he manipulated, the blessing. God lets us get ourselves into circumstances, doesn't he? I know I've been in a few. And our corners, or corners, that we create for our, from our own devices, so we finally cry out for change to him. You know, there's been a few times in my life, and I'm sure there's been a few times in yours, where I went my own way, believing, making myself believe this is the way God wanted me to go. Doing things I shouldn't have did. Stepping out where I shouldn't have stepped out and should have stayed on the trail that God gave me to go. And you take a beating when you do that. There's a lot of problems when you do that. I know a lot of people, I mean, when I first got saved, I'm going to say three, five years into it, I, I kind of gave up. I, I remember at one point just saying, I can't live this kind of life. That's crazy. I just can't do this. And what I didn't realize is I was trying to relig live a religious life. I wasn't, it wasn't like it was at first where, where I met Jesus and I had this wonderful relationship. I was trying to be all religious and, you know, do all the things that you're supposed to do and go through all the motions you're supposed to go through. And uh, so I kind of gave up there for a while and I kind of started drifting off. I wasn't doing anything really bad at first, but, you know, sin has a way of growing. And you start getting into things and all of a sudden you're going down this road. And luckily for me, I hit this one spot, and I just got slapped really hard by God, and it kind of shook me up, and I said, you know what? I don't want to do this. I wanna, I'm, I'm, I'm going back. I'm going back to the Lord. Now, a lot of people tell you that's it. You, you lost your salvation at that point. There was a lot of people in the assemblies that day that would tell you that. Thank God I don't listen to them. Anyway, uh, what I'm saying to you is I don't know what you've been through and I don't know what you, you, you've done, but just like Jacob here, you know, God let him, what we used to say is uh, take a lot of rope to hang himself. And he got himself into a situation in a place where he finally figured out, I got no options. I got to go to God. I got I to gotta get something from God. But see, God wanted something from Jacob. He wanted something from Jacob. You know what that was? It was Jacob. He wanted Jacob. He wanted his devotion. He wanted to make him Israel. And see, we can kind of respond to this. I know Jacob wasn't born again or anything like that. But see, that's what happens with people. God wants to change us on the inside. He wants to make us what he wants us to be. See, he looks at us like a, 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 an artist looks at a stone. And he sees in it something that is wonderful, but it's just an ugly big stone. But then he starts hitting it with the chisel and the hammer. And little by little, it begins to form. Sometimes that hurts. I know it's hurt me many times. And I still get hurt. I know I'm not perfect. I know you're not perfect. God's always working in us. And we're always... Uh, trying to reach out to him and sometimes we give up and I don't mean give up and walk away but we, we go yeah you know I've done that a million times I've never been healed of that or I never seem to overcome this situation these things just don't seem to work out and I think this is a wonderful story about how God is always working even when we don't see him around it, it's something's going on and he's trying to work these things out of our life because there's something in us that's preventing it from happening. 
There's something that we're doing in our hearts or, or in our thinking and, and that is not with what God wants to do. I had this story here. I don't know. You probably all heard this a million times. Anybody that's been to church for a while heard this, the butterfly story, where this guy comes out for lunch, and he's sitting down having a sandwich on a bench, and uh, there's this uh, little cocoon there, and there's one wing on, and this caterpillar became a butterfly, and he's trying to work his way out you know, of the cocoon. So, you know, he bends over and opens it up for him, lets him get out a little bit. And then he goes back from lunch. Well, at the end of the day, he comes back out. And there's the butterfly on the ground. The, the wing that was still inside is laying on the ground, and, and it's dead. He circumvented the process. See, many times we circumvent the process God is using in our lives. See, it's necessary for that butterfly to struggle to get out of there. Why? Why is it necessary? Because it gives him strength. He's getting stronger as he's coming out. He's, he's getting ready to come out. And you circumvent that, and he never gets that strong. The struggle, as a matter of fact, I named this, what did I call it? The struggle is real. It's real. We're all in that struggle. The struggle will bring about strength in us. Not to overcome the situation, but to learn we can do nothing about our sinful nature without God. You know how many times I tried to quit smoking? <laughs> you know how many times I tried to quit drinking? I mean, when I first got saved, you know, I tried, especially when I was being all religious. I couldn't do that. I couldn't change who I was about that. And why does God leave that in us? I mean, God delivered me from so many things, but why did he leave that? If you ever read through Joshua and Kings and so on and so forth, you see that God left people in the land to prove the next generation with. See, there's, there's battles we must fight, and there's battles that God you know, but we got to learn to fight them with God and not with our flesh, not with our cunning, not with our conniving like Jacob did, not, not trying to bring about the end we want to happen because we're smart or we know something, but because we know God and we're friends of God. We got to let Him work through us, we got to take His direction. In John 6, 28 through 29, then they said to him, this is uh, the uh, Gospel of John, I'm sorry, uh, chapter 6, and not many people ever caught this, but I, this always stuck out to me, verses uh, 28 and 29. Then they said to him, this was after he fed the 5,000 on the other side, he came across in the boat, he's over there, and they came over there and they said to him, how'd you get here? You know, and they had this conversation going on. And he's talking with them, and then he says to them, they said to him, what shall we do that, uh, that we might work the works of God? What, what do I need to do for you, Lord, to, to work the works of God? That's, that was their question. And Jesus answered and said unto them, now listen to this, this is the work of God, that you believe on him who he sent. That you believe on him who he sent. What is the work of God? That you believe on him whom he sent. How do you do the works of God? That you believe on him who he sent. Who did he send? Jesus Christ. That's who he sent. Jesus answered and said unto them that you must believe on him who he sent. If we could have overcome evil, our sin, in our own strength, we wouldn't have needed a redeemer. We wouldn't need one. We wouldn't need Jesus. We wouldn't need somebody to go to the cross and be a sacrifice. We, we could have done it on our own, but yet we keep trying to do things on our own. We keep trying to change us on our own instead of letting God change us, instead of going to the one, the source, the one who has the power and the authority and has, who has already taken care of these things. It's already done. Believing God is on, an ongoing struggle for us. We are one-third, one-third spirit. 
Our body and soul have not been redeemed. We are constantly in a battle with the world, the flesh, the devil. The battle is real and the struggle is real. Most people don't want I most people I know that's been Christians for a while want to act like they have no struggles inside their hearts. Yes, they have struggles out here. But I'm here to tell you I don't care how long you are a Christian, you could be a Christian for 100 years, you still got stuff. And you still got to deal with it. And you still got to admit to it. You still got to understand. That's that's the humility that should be in us. So that when we look at other people, here's the thing I never get is like you know, I was kind of condemning myself the other day because down where I'm working, uh, I, I'm out on this concourse all the time, and there's all kinds of homeless people that sit out there. I don't know, 10, 15, 20 of them will pop up there around 7 a.m., and they'll be sitting on the benches because it's nice in there. There's air conditioning, and in the winter, it's warm. And they'll be out there, and they're doing different things. And you got some crazies. You know, we got this one guy. He's got a bunch of signs. He's always holding up as people walk by. He's mad about something. And I've never read this sign. <laughs> I've never read the sign. But obviously he has some mental problems, right? And I said to myself, you know, I should be praying for those people instead of making fun of these people. You know, you walk by with a smirk and, you know, every day, same thing. And you know what? That's not right. See, that's me, right? Am I not at fault? Of course I'm at fault. And, you know, you get into this habit because, you know, life is a routine sometimes. You know, instead of praying for these people or praying in tongues and letting God lead me into some kind of relief for them or help for them or, you know, or just plainly just out and out praying for them because those people need help. But this is a struggle, you know, this is a struggle. But see, if you're listening, if you're hearing God, if you're, if you're communicating with God, and, and, you're, and you're opening yourself up to it, if you're admitting these selves to yourself, instead of like God said, you're always hiding behind his head, you're always trying to hide something, like I don't know what's there. We, he knows it's there. And he says, bring it to me. Bring it to me and I'll fix it. Bring it to me. Bring it to me and I'll fix it. Bring it. Bring you to me and I'll fix you. Believing God is an ongoing struggle for us. We already said that. Third is struggle. All right. Uh, we are constantly in a battle with the world, the flesh, and the devil. The battle is real and the struggle is real. We have old habits, physical troubles, and needs for our lives in this world. Through all these things, we must believe in the one Father God sent and that is the Lord Jesus Christ, who can deliver us from these circumstances and happy to do so. It is us who fail in our believing. We fail in our believing. This is the patience of the saints. We wrestle against flesh and blood, against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We struggle. It is not instantaneous. You know, a lot of people like to see that. You know, they go up and, ooh, ooh they fall down. And, oh, that brother, I'm, oh, yeah, I would say. You know what? I don't know half the time if that's true or not, but here's, here's the facts is that they've probably been working on that a long time before that ever happened. <laughs> right? A long time before it ever happened. We must stop working in our own strength. We should not be manipulating, planning, or engaging spiritual battles with physical and mental abilities. Our physical and mental abilities will never overcome those kind of problems, especially if you're a Christian, because you being a Christian, if you're born again, you're a target. You're a target. And if you start using weapons that you don't supposed to have in your hands, it's going to come back on you. It's going to come back on you. You'll pay the price. The patience of the saints is to rest in the provisions God has already made. He's made our provision. We access them through the four pillars of God. Nobody knows what that is, right? What are they? Prayer, fasting, worship, and the study of God's word. Three or four pillars of God. We're pillars of God. 
There's no other way to serve God. This is how you communicate with him. Matthew 6, 33, 34. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil therein. And you know, and if the Bible tells you every day there's evil, every day there's evil therein. And every day you've got to deal with it. But we should not, because the Lord has said time and time again to us, I have supplied these things. You need to rest in the provision. You need to believe. You don't need to take up your hands against these people. You don't need to try to manipulate people. You just need to believe in me and bring it to me in prayer. That's all you need to do. Worship before my throne when you're entering. What did Paul do when he was in Phili at the prison in Philippi? He worshiped God. He didn't, he didn't go, I'm going to get a lawyer. I'm going to sue these people. I'm going to bring down, I'm a Roman citizen, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. He didn't do that. He just worshiped God. He worshiped God. And God answered in a big way. I wish I could get that done. But, <laughs> but think about it. I mean, you know, they're there worshiping with chains. Because, you know, prison wasn't like prison is today. That guard offended me. I want something done about that. No, it wasn't like that. You're all beat up, chained to the wall. And if you have to go to the bathroom, God help you. You know, because this is how it was. And, you know, here's your food. Here's a piece of bread. You know, that's prison. These guys are really suffering. And they still weren't complaining. And they didn't take off when the doors opened. How did he know not to do that? How did he know? Because he had a relationship. And him and God talk. Praise God. If we could be that way, right? God says, deal with what is in front of you today. Leave worry and projecting the future alone. He knows what your needs are. And he is more than capable, more than capable of dealing with it. We must believe this and rest in his provision. And I, I, I'm reluctant to read this, but I, I uh, have uh, Hebrews chapter 4 here, and uh, verses 1 through 11. Yeah, I guess it wouldn't hurt. Let us therefore fear, lest we, uh, a promise being left us entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. He's referring to the Old Testament saints that came out of Egypt. But the word preached to them did not profit, not being mixed with what? Faith. Faith in them that had it. For we which have believed do enter into rest. What's the rest? Yes, but what is our Sabbath? That's right. That he has made what? The provisions that we're looking for. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. He, you know, God's saying things were finished from the foundation of the world. I had these things ready for these people before they, before they even existed. Before they even existed. I don't like this thing. Um... You know, if you went back to Genesis and you looked at that there, you know, there's six days there that uh, things were going on. You know, God never asked mankind. He never created mankind to the sixth day. You know why? Because he didn't need his help. He don't need our help. He has no need for our help. What he wants is our fellowship. What he wants is our love. What he wants is our attention. What he wants is you and me. That's what he wants. He has no need for us to help him do things. Oh Lord, but I, I want a man. Oh Lord, I want a woman. Oh Lord, I want a Cadillac. You ain't getting no Cadillac. <laughs> but you know what? The desires of our heart need to be the desires of God heart. I understand people want love 
people want certain things. But you know, we live in this culture that is very confusing with this book, and I'll tell you why. Because most of the world don't live as good as we do. I'm going to say all the world don't live as good as we do. The things we cry about and complain about are so <coughs> selfish and terrible. I, I mean, it's just, you know, ever since I stopped watching television completely, I, I have such a different perspective on life. You know, well, I'm not putting that junk into my heart anymore. I'm not listening to things that I don't need to listen to. I'm not hearing things that I don't need to hear. And it, it just makes me more aware when the Spirit speaks to me, He can speak to me now in a different way. Because now I can see things I couldn't see before. Because those things were hardening my heart. I remember arguments with people who say, well, I like to watch a good movie where the guys are fighting. And you know what? That ain't good for you. I don't care what anybody says. That ain't good for you. Because, you know, I always found myself, I'd be getting anxious. And even news, they're making me worry about something that's happening on the other side of the world I can't do a thing about at all. Yeah, yeah, I can pray. But you know what? I wouldn't know about those things. And, and generations before me would have never known about those things. They dealt with where they were and what was in front of them. That was their life, and that's all God makes us responsible for. All this junk through these televangelists and all this stupid stuff they say to people, and people swallow it whole. It's foolishness. It's foolishness. You should be concerned about your community and the people around you. That's the people you can affect. Yeah, you can give them missions. Yeah, they, but see, you're giving to something that someone else is going to do. You don't need to get all uptight and all worried about things. Well, what if, what if they're going to drop a bomb? Oh, you can't do nothing about it anyway. You're dead. Bang, you're dead. You go to be with the Lord. Right? I mean, I know, I know there might, there's a lot of people who disagree with that thinking. But I'll tell you, it has helped me immensely not to be involved in that stuff. Now, I'm not telling you I don't watch little things on my, my YouTube because I do. I, I listen to especially a lot of different teachers and preachers on there, mostly. But I see stuff on there. I, I used to have people that watch things like the, there's this stupid show on. What, I'm trying to think with a bunch of geniuses. The Big Bang Theory. And it, everything seems to be an innuendo about sex or some perversion of some kind or how stupid his uh, born-again mother is. You see, why am I going to sit there and watch something they're going to slam my God over day and night? Amen. Why am I going to let that in my heart? Why am I going to let those kind of things into me? Why am I going to listen to that and call it entertainment? Or what? Or funny. And here's the truth. I'll laugh. You know, I've made this case for years, but 30 years ago I was telling people, you can't bring homosexuals in there and laugh at them. That's how they're going to get in. And that's how they got in. All of a sudden they were funny, and then all of a sudden they were acceptable. They were there. And that was just the beginning. That was just the beginning. Do I hate homosexuals? No, I don't. I used to live around a lot of them. Prisons are filled with them. And... What I'm saying to you is, is that these things, we, it's our heart. What is it? Guard your heart at all costs. Why? Because the issues of life are in your heart. The issues of your life are in your heart. What, is it, what comes out of a man's mouth is what condemns a man, what brings him down, not the things that you eat even though I do eat kosher, but it's besides the point. We won't get into that. For we, uh, <laughs> three, for we which be have believed to do, do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath that they shall enter in my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the earth. We covered that. For he has spoken somewhere about the seventh day. In this way, God had rested on the seventh day from his works. But to, re, 
repeat the text side it earlier, cited earlier, they will never enter my rest. Therefore, it remains for some to enter it. Yet those to whom it was previously proclaimed did not enter because of disobedience. So God again ordained a certain day today, speaking through David's uh, after so long a time, as in the words quoted before, oh, that today you would listen as he speaks. Do not harden your heart. You hear that? Do not harden your heart. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of it about another day. Consequently, a Sabbath rest remains for the people of God. That's the rest she was talking about. The Sabbath rest remains for the... What is, the Sabbath represented what? This rest that we have. The Sabbath represented this rest that we have. What's that rest? 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we can have rest in our Messiah. That's what the rest is. We rest in the kingdom of God because we have entered the kingdom of God because you can't even see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. You cannot even see it if you're not born again. And I've come to learn this. You know, I used to, <laughs> people used to preach, you know, once you become born again, that's it, you're saved. But you know what? You see the kingdom of God. You still got to decide what to do with the kingdom of God. And as we're talking about right here, you're born again. Yes, you're saved. But there's, there's more clarification, and there's more clarification, and there's more clarification. As you give that heart of yours over to God, there's more clarification. For the one who enters God's rest has also rested from his works, just as God did from his works. So we must make every effort to enter that rest. You hear that? Verse 11 says, so we must make every effort, every effort to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the following the same pattern of disobedience that he was just referring to. Now, you know, this is why I, I, I have trouble with people that preach once saved, always saved. There's got to be at least a hundred of these in the New Testament that tells you, you know, look at what happened to them. That'll happen to you. And they're, they're making reference to what happened to them. This is going to happen to you if you live in disobedience. In other words, if you live, live in disobedience to God, you can, you can lose out. You can, you can lose out. But besides that point, it is, uh, we must make every effort, every effort to enter the kingdom of God into his rest. This is the reason for the things you go through, to be battle ready, to experience, and how to use your faith in battle. The darkness in your life and in the world around you and in the enemy that roars like a lion. We got to learn that, once again, we can't work with our own genius and our own manipulation, but that we have to rely on God, and through that is how we overcome these circumstances. If you don't have experience in exercising your authority through Christ, you not only can't help yourself, but you can do nothing for others in the body or out of the body. What can you do for people who don't know God, and what can you do for people that do know God if you don't ha have not exercised your faith, if you have not exercised this, this prerogative you have through God. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 13 through 14. For everyone who partakes of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. You learn. When you first come to Christ, you're learning. You're, you're being taught things. You hear good things. You hear bad things. You know, and, you, and the spirit that is in you helps you sort these things out if you're relying on God. If you're relying on God. But soul... But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. This is those who, by reason of use, have their senses exercised discerning both good and evil. You learn good and evil, and you can explain those things to people. If you can't explain what you know, you don't know it. Ephesians chapter 4, 13 through 15. Till we all come into the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, I don't think that they expect us to really do that. But that is our goal, to be like Christ, to let Christ live in us and he live through us so that we are stronger in him, that we have after 
Be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. I got a few minutes left because we got uh, communion today. But I'd like to touch on this. Being mammied about by every slight of doctrine. Even when Paul was teaching people, even when Paul was here and all the apostles were here, they were dealing with people who were trying to enter into the body and bring heresies and bad doctrine to the people and change your heart. And now, if this wasn't a problem, they would have never talked about it. If this wasn't a danger, they would have never talked about it. And of course they talked about it. Paul, Paul out now pretty much condemned a couple people saying he, he, he would want them to go you know where because he rather have that happen than them destroy the lives of the people they were manipulating. And today you have the same thing. You have people teaching people that their goal should be to be rich and to be whatever it is they're teaching them in those churches, you know, and, and those doctrines that you, you deserve so much. Only in very rich countries does that float because I don't think that would work in Ethiopia. I don't think it would work in Afghanistan, you know? But what I'm trying to say is that they come along with all kinds of things. Doctrine is what the Bible says. Doctrine is what the Bible says and what the Holy Spirit, who you've been born again through, teaches you that it means. And if you go to any other source, you better very much trust that source because that source can influence you. You must try it against the scripture. I, I like people. I like a certain amount of people. And I've heard them say things that I could never agree with. Now, I disagree with them in love. I disagree with them. And I'm not, and unless they're out there really doing something really evil, um, you know, I don't want to say something bad about them or, or bring them down. But speaking the truth in love, that's, that says this. Is this, this, is, this is a mature Christian. He'll tell you to your face you're wrong and why you're wrong. And you may disagree with him at some point, but he still loves you. He still cares about you. But I'm telling you the truth. This is how it is. And you're going to hurt yourself going that other way. This is going to cause you problems. That's a good brother. That's a good sister. Right? Amen. Are we close to that? Um, one more thing. We build altars and we, be, we dig wells to encounter God. We don't know our God through casual relationships. We are to have an intimate, personal relationship with God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder, a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. When you're seeking him for that thing that you're seeking him for, if it's a good thing, I'm not saying for something stupid, but I'm saying for, you know, for healing or for somebody to be saved or whatever the case is, whatever you're, you're he wants to reward us. But he's, he can only do that through faith, through you having faith in him, through you having faith in him. You know, all those struggles that the people we read about in the Bible go through beforehand, and it, they ain't for nothing. He didn't have people do all that for nothing. He had that, them do that so that they could come to this place with him when they have an encounter with him, they were building their altars and they were praying to him and they were seeking him. And he taught them to dig wells. Wells represent the flow of the Holy Spirit. And, th and those wells bring things into them and they were able to encounter the God that they're worshiping. They were able to encounter the one who has made them promises. And in their encountering him, they were answered or made whole or whatever the case may be. Because when you encounter God, God is more than able 
more than able. And he wants to have more encounters with you than you would ever know. He wants us to be with him all the time. I mean, when you read about Mo Moses and uh, Joshua, they weren't under the new covenant, but you, Joshua and Moses were constantly with God. Constantly. And they still had a life. They still had children. They still had a family. But they were constantly with God. And, and that's a picture of what we should be now. You say, well, I got to work. I say, well, so did they. They had things to do. But in their heart and in their mind, they had given over to the Lord. And they would, they would think upon him and talk with him. You know, when you're pondering on scripture and you're, all of a sudden you go, oh, that's what that is. Or, oh, that, that's, that's God. Do you know that? That's God speaking to you. He's answering you. He ain't going, I got 10, you know, this is what people expect, but God is that still, small voice within us that he's waiting for us to get somewhere and be quiet and to hear him and to let him explain things to us. God don't talk like we talk. God uses few words. God, God don't sit there and talk about the weather, you know. He talks to you directly about that thing. And whatever it is, are what he wants. Every time I do a sermon, it's because I sit down and I listen and I meditate. And all week long, I'm, I got things going through my head. I'm thinking about and waiting for, is it this one, Lord, or is it that one? Because I'm already talking to him about two, three other things in Scripture. And then he'll finally come to me and go, this is it. And all of a sudden, this will open up, and this will open up. It's like, a, it's like a flower. You know, it just, the more it gets into the sun of God, it, it, it just keeps blooming, and it brings enlightenment and understanding. And I said, oh, I've never seen that. Oh, yeah, that look, that, that'll fit. That looks good. That looks good. I don't go on the Internet. I don't get my sermons from other people. They bore me to death. I could not stand here and do that. I don't know how people do that, but they do. Anyway, God bless you.